morning. So last class, we learned about sonnets. You guys took notes on the different types of sonnets and what sonnets were. So we're going to read one together, and then you'll just have a couple of questions to answer about the poem, and that's it for today. Next class, I won't see you until Wednesday of next week. You guys will be trying to do what we're doing right now, except on your own. So I'll hold your hand this time, and let's see how you do with the sonnets. Um, we'll do a little activity together in class Wednesday and Thursday. This sonnet is called Whoso List to Hunt, and it's by the author Sir Thomas Wyatt, which if you remember from your notes, he's an English author. This is British literature, but he writes in the Italian style of sonnets, so not quite the English sonnets yet. Whoso list to hunt might be confusing for you. So if you look on this slide, the translation of that title is simply whoever cares to hunt or whoever wants to hunt. So based on that, um, if we were doing this in class, I would ask you, what do you think he's going to be saying in this poem? If the title is whoever wants to go hunting or whoever cares to hunt, he's probably going to give you some tips on hunting, although it might not be exactly what you think. So. He's going to tell us, um, give some advice to those who want to go hunting. If you remember from the background notes, we said Italian sonnets are split up into an octave and a sestet, the first eight lines and the first six lines. So we'll read these first eight lines and then we'll kind of break it down um, and see if we can translate what's happening here. Who's so this to hunt? I know where is an hind. But as for me, alas, I may know more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore. I am of them that furthest come behind. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer. But as she fleeth afore, fainting I follow. I leave off therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. I know you're probably hearing all of those lines and saying I have no stinking idea what is happening there. But if you take it a little bit of a time, you can figure out most of what's going on in these sonnets. So just to reiterate, this is an Italian sonnet. If we couldn't tell from the fact that we have an octave and a sestet, the rhyme scheme shows us that. A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. Hind and behind rhyme more and sore, and then they rhyme with these lines down here. But anyway, let's translate. Right from that very first line, whoso lists to hunt. We just said the title of this poem is whoso lists to hunt, and that means whoever wants to hunt. Whoever wants to go hunting, I know where there's a hind, he says. So the speaker is talking to whoever's reading this, his audience, and he says, whoever wants to go hunting, I know where you can find a deer. But a hind is not just any deer. It is a female deer. If you ever want to go hunting, I know where you can find a female deer. Well, if we have any hunters in the audience, you know that you actually want the, the bucks, the guys with the antlers. That's who you're usually shooting for. So why do you think she must be female? Maybe because this poem isn't really about a deer. He's using a metaphor of hunting a deer to talk about a woman, which is what most of these sonnets are really about. He says, as for me, alas, I may know more. So whoever wants to go hunting, I know where you can find a deer. But as for me, I may know more. What do you think he means when he says, I may know more? He's saying, as for me, I'm done. I'm not hunting her anymore. So just from those first two lines, he's saying, whoever wants to go hunting, I know where you can find a female deer, a female. As for me, I'm done hunting her, chasing her, pursuing after her. I'm giving up the chase. He says, the vain travail hath wearied me so sore. Vain travail hath wearied me so sore. What is travail? What do you think that means? What does vain mean first? Obviously, it means conceited. That's one definition. But if you are studying for your math test in vain, you still fail. That means it's pointless. So what do you think he means? The vain travail has made me so sore. He's saying this pointless chase, I've been chasing this deer, this female deer for so long and it's exhausted me. I am mentally, emotionally, and physically exhausted. I'm giving up the chase because I just can't do it anymore. He says, I am of them that furthest come behind. So we find out in this line that other hunters are hunting the deer. 
And in relation to them, where does the speaker fall? He says, I am of them that furthest come behind. So out of all these hunters that are pursuing this deer, all of these men that are chasing this woman, we find out that he's in last place, at least according to himself. He feels like he's furthest behind of all of these men that are pursuing this woman. But he's using this metaphor of comparing her to a deer. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, but as she fleeth afore, fainting I follow. So in those couple of lines, he's saying, you know, I want to give up. I'm the furthest behind. It doesn't seem like I'm making any progress in getting this girl, hunting this deer. When I try to take my mind off of her, my wearied mind, my tired mind, every time I try to take it off the deer, she does something that just brings me right back. She fleeth a floor. So this is my little deer leap. She just flees, runs right by. So just when he finally forgets about her for a second, when he finally feels like he can stop thinking about this girl or chasing this girl, she does something to give him hope. And so he's using, again, this hunting metaphor. Just when he gives up chasing her in the woods, hunting her, he sees her run by. And so he continues the chase. But really, we know this isn't about a deer. This is about a woman. So he's saying, just when I'm going to give up, I'm exhausted of chasing this girl. She gives me just a little bit of hope, and I can't give up the chase again. But he says, I leave off, therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. I leave off, therefore, I'm done. Therefore, he says, I'm done. I'm giving up chasing this girl. I'm not going to do it anymore. Since in a net, I seek to hold the wind. What do you think he means by that? I'm done chasing this girl, chasing this deer, because it's like trying to catch the wind in a net. What do you think that means? I don't know if you've ever tried to catch the wind in a net, but it's an impossible task. You cannot do it. It's impossible. So that's what he's saying. I'm giving up. I'm done chasing this deer since what I'm trying to do is impossible. I can't do it. You can't catch the wind in a net. So I'm giving up chasing her. And here's a little gif of my cousin trying to catch the wind in a net. Last six lines, the sestet of this poem are this. Who list her hunt, this is the title again, whoever wants to hunt her, whoever cares to go after this deer, let me put you out of doubt, let me ease your mind, as well as I may spend his time in vain, engraven with diamonds and letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about, noli me tangier, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. So again, if we break this down, that very first line, we can pretty much translate exactly. Whoever wants to go hunting, let me ease your mind here. Let me put you out of doubt um, with what's going to happen. I'm giving you a warning to anyone who wants to go after this particular deer. Let me ease your mind. As well as I, just like me, if you go after her, you will spend your time in vain. Remember from the last slide, we said the meaning of vain, not just conceited, is what? Pointless. You're wasting your time. So anybody that wants to go after this deer, you are wasting your time. He's giving a warning to all these other hunters. And then he says, engraven with diamonds and letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about. Around her neck, she's wearing like a diamond collar, this deer. So she's actually not a wild deer. She's wearing a collar. Somebody owns her on this diamond collar written in the words is noli me tangier for caesar's i am and that first phrase translates to don't touch me for caesar's i am so we find out the deer is wearing a diamond collar that says don't touch me i belong to caesar who could caesar be well every year i usually get one person that says the dressing there is a caesar dressing yep Julius Caesar, they're obviously talking about the king, Julius Caesar, but this is England in many, many, many years after Julius Caesar was the king. So who do you think that they're talking about? Well, he's making a little joke here, a little stab at the king of England. And if you remember from the background notes we took last class, we talked about a king of England who was pretty well known for loving the ladies, for having multiple wives. 
So actually, if we use the history to, to kind of tie into this poem, we find out that this poem is really about the speaker is in love with someone that King Henry VIII is in love with. And based on the history and the time period, we know that Sir Thomas Wyatt, the guy who wrote this poem, he was in love with Anne Boleyn, who is Henry VIII's second wife. So he's saying as much as he would love to be with her, it, it seems like all these men are in love with her. It's a pointless chase because she already belongs to the king. The king has already said that he wants her and wants to be with her. So she doesn't really have a choice. And wild for to hold, though I seem tame. That's what's also written on her collar. So although she seems tame, the deer is really wild, is what that question is asking you. It seems like um, somebody has captured her, but she doesn't want to be tied down by any of these men or any of these hunters. So he's saying pursuing her is pointless. You cannot get her. The king already has laid claim to her, and she doesn't really want to be caught anyway. So ch chasing after this girl is pointless. Here um, is Mrs. Cecilia's excellent deer drawing. Looks exactly like a deer. I did this on a computer, so give me some credit here. Um, but this is kind of an illustration of what he's talking about there. So there's the beautiful deer, um, and she's wearing this like diamond collar. And so on the collar are these words, Noli me tangier, don't touch me, I belong to Caesar. And even though I look tame, I'm really wild. So he's giving a warning to all these other men that want to go after this girl. You can't have her. It's impossible to get her. It's like trying to catch the wind in a net. It's an impossible task. That's it. It's a whole entire sonnet. So I have for you on the Google Classroom some questions to answer. And so some of these that we would talk about um, cover that those questions on that sheet. So you might see some repeat questions as long as you're paying attention to this video. Is this poem really about a deer? No, it is not actually about a deer. He's using this example of a man hunting a deer to talk about what? It is really about a man pursuing a woman. He wants to get this woman. He wants to be with her. That's what he's using this analogy of a man hunting a deer for. What is he saying about this woman? Well, he's saying that he seems like She's not interested. He's pursuing her, pursuing her, pursuing her. She doesn't want to be caught. She has a bunch of other guys coming after her. Um, he's ready to give up is basically what he's saying here. And then at the end, we also find out what is he saying about this woman, that she's already been claimed by somebody else, the king in particular. Who is this woman? You remember who I said from the last slide? It is Anne Boleyn, we find out, um, based on history. So this is the woman in which Henry VIII had already taken an interest. He was already hoping to divorce his first wife to be with her. And um, we know that from history that this is really about her. Sir Thomas Wyatt had an interest in her. Last question asks you, what does it mean? What do you think we learn about the author, Sir Thomas Wyatt, based on the fact that he chooses to compare pursuing a woman to hunting a deer. He paints her as an animal for the hunt. What do you think that tells us about him as a person? I would say that he has a pretty um, misogynistic view of the relationship between men and women. Does the deer really get a choice in any of this? No, she's being hunted by these men and whoever hunts her or gets her is the one who claims her. She's like a prize for the taking. It's not really her choice. It's not like she's an equal partner in this. They're the hunters and she's the prey. So that tells us a little bit about Sir Thomas Wyatt and how he views relationships, that it was kind of the man pursuing the woman. She's like a prize to be one, we could say. All, right. All you need to do is make sure you answer those questions in the Google Classroom. So not these questions. There is a Google Doc, although some of these questions are the same. There's a couple other ones on there to check your understanding and that you paid attention to this poem. So answer those, upload them to the Google Classroom, and that is it for today. Have a good day. I will see you next week and make good choices.